Welcome to 15K Plus Random Movie Reviews, where we take random movies from Metacritic's 15K Plus Movies to randomly watch whether we like it or not. Hello and welcome to episode 33 of 15K Plus Random Movie Reviews. This is Colin. And this is Niall. And this is Random Movie number 8,623, Crooked House from 2017, Metascore of 59, user score of 5.8, so users and critics in agreement there. Runs for an hour and 55 minutes. It had a budget of 10 million. I don't know how much it made. So, (laughs) who knows? Yeah, uh, completely under the radar. I'd never heard of it before. And it's an Agatha Christie movie, so you you would usually expect to at least hear about it. But, Yeah. yeah. Well, I never like I never heard of this book. The book, this book, like obviously we know of the the major ones, you know. It, it's a dark one for Miss Christie, isn't it? She has an she has a tendency to go for the um go for the bizarre solution. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's her that's her style, and I kind of. I semi sort of predicted it when one character said something at the start of the movie and it was like, oh yeah, you're the killer, aren't you? <laughs> but then you go through a couple of twists and turns near the end Yeah, as well. and she keeps you guessing. That's standard fare for Miss Christie, you know, she, to start off with, oh, it's obviously blah. And then you're like, oh, I don't know. And you're like, oh yeah, it is blah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I found it a bit harder this time because, you know, trying to think about production and acting and all this crap and trying to figure out... <laughs> <laughs> who's Taking actually notes. done the killing you're like oh crap um. yeah yeah um directed by gilles paquet brenner uh french dude with french movies hasn't done a lot of reputable english speakies talkies as you like to call them i don't like that uh, you know. uh julian fallows is one of the writers and he yes yeah he, you can predictably tell that he wrote Lots of episodes of Downton Abbey. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it feels a bit like yeah. that at times. Yeah, and he Period won an Oscar. Fantastic. Yeah, he won an Oscar for Gosford Park back in the day. Mm. Writing that, yeah. Um, yeah, the film score got a couple of awards from just random uh, movie festival type thingies. Hugo de Char was the composer. I didn't really notice the score, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I don't see where we would have gotten an, an award from. Like there was a couple of scenes at clubs and you know, night well, nightclubs mm. and rock bar, whatever the hell it was, yeah. with interesting music, but not definitely not warranting a, an award. Nah, nah. There was a couple of um, notable pop songs from the fifties mm. or whatever, but uh, yeah, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, yeah, obviously based on Agatha Christie, and it's this movie, this movie, this story is actually was one of her favorite stories. So that's an interesting, oh, one of her favorite. personal favorites. Yes, yeah, yeah, ah, okay, yeah. Um, you want to nutshell the basics, or I was thinking yeah. of just reading instead of us nutshelling, just to read the synopsis that's on the Metacritic site, so we don't have to think about it and then just get on to the plot. I don't know. Let's do that. That, that, okay. that might simplify things. Yeah, it'll simplify things. So uh, there's suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of a wealthy patriarch, and is and it's investigated by spy turned private detective Charles Hayward, played by Max Irons, who is lured by his former lover to catch her grandfather's murderer before Scotland Yard exposes dark family secrets on the sprawling estate amidst the poisonous atmosphere of bitterness, resentment, and jealousy in a truly crooked house. Uh, Hayward encounters three generations of the dynasty, including a theatre actress, Gillian Anderson, the old man's widow, 50 years a junior, Christina Hendricks, and the family matriarch, Lady Edith de Havilland, Glenn Close. Yeah. That sums it up reasonably well. Um, Better than we would. Yeah. That's it. And uh, join us next week. For- <laughs> yeah. Let's read every page of Metacritic's <laughs> reviews, and that's the review. Yeah. So. It, it, it had a reasonably good cast. Um, not mentioned in the synopsis is Mr. Terrence Stamp, which I always like to mention. Uh, you do. An actor I, I quite like his onstage uh, presence. Yeah, but I was looking through his... Uh, Un- underutilized here. Oh, yeah. But I was looking through his back catalogue and it's like, yeah, we know his name and we know things, but like, can you name any of his big characters he played? Zod. 
<laughs> Carol Zod. What's uh, that? Where's that from? S- Superman 2. Oh. Oh my God. Come on. No, I, no, I remember. Kneel that. before Zod, Colin. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's when he's. <laughs> is he weakened by the kryptonite? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a rookie, rookie mistake there. Zod. He also played Chancellor Vabrun in Phantom Menace. He did indeed, and he was uh, a, a he was he was fabulous in what was that Australian movie? Um, oh, dang! Um, Neighbors, the movie. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I went through. I was like, okay, yeah, 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 I know, but like, he hasn't really ever got that massive role where it's like, oh yeah, I remember him there. He's amazing. Which is a shame because I think he's got the well. It's it's my opinion. He's got the the presence and the gravitas to to, to carry stuff off, but he's never really landed anything. He's got the chops. He has the chops. Just hasn't got the agent. My problem, yeah. My problem with this movie was that I felt that the acting and the characters were very blah, very cardboard. I thought Max Irons playing Charles Hayward was terrible. He was forgettable. Not absolutely forgettable. So forgettable. He's like watching Stephanie Martini uh, playing Sophia. The, the love interest of Max Irons and the the lady who drags him into it, again forgettable. Um, yeah. she, she was okay. Glenn Close was reasonably interesting, but again, eh, formulaic. Yeah. She reminded me of um, Mrs. Trunchbull in Matilda. <laughs> like she she was not 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 as vicious. <laughs> no, not the not the original one. The newest one, where um, what do you call her? Um, the English actress plays Mrs. Trunchbull, Emma Thompson. Oh, I haven't um, seen that one. Yeah, she looks. Oh, your kids would love it. Um, it's she looks exactly like her, and when she's stomping around shooting at the moles, she looks. Yeah, exactly I did like that. <laughs> Mrs. Trunchbull. Yeah, yeah. I get but that. No. She's a big lady. Yeah, I was so bored during this movie. Uh-huh. Again, like there was a runtime one fifty five, like that. Yeah, yeah. For a, for an Agatha Christie movie, that's silly. But I must say, come on, Max Irons must have um, somehow used somebody he knows to get this lead role. (laughs) Daddy Poos? Daddy. Yeah, he's not not his daddy. Maybe it was just a bad script, or maybe it was a bad screenplay, or maybe he sucks. Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. Um, Ah, He's just so, like, he's a pretty boy, right? But he's not amazingly pretty to make you go oh let's see the next thing he's in he doesn't have he didn't have any sort of character characteristics to that enchanted me or he, he was actually he was on, on screen he was the weakest yeah and, and he's that's the an bloody main role yeah because he is the main uh, second worst in my opinion was the love interest because again i don't care like she, she doesn't make it into, i actually thought the the young girl was reasonably good um yeah 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 i i like christina hendrix whenever she's in stuff um and she, she was, was weird too. The she role was weird. she played, yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah. Like, I lo- like Gillian Anderson from the X Files. I love her, but she was she, she had hammed two it good up. lines in it. And in, 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 uh, I think the only good line or the good piece that I can remember from her was when she was hungover um, mm. uh, at a dinner table uh, for breakfast, and then she walked out after two lines of actually acting for a change. The rest of it felt phoned in. Yeah, uh, I was just it was just wooden and low energy and nothing was and the fact that it was set in the 50s whatever everything was very dull and dusty and uh it was just there's nothing in it to entertain me for the nearly two hours and the script wasn't exciting and the plot had twists and turns near the end but you knew what was going to happen it was like yeah yeah they're not the killers just Hurry up with the exposition of who the bloody killer is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert, the, the killer in it is exposed pretty much straight from the start because of her yeah. um, psychopathic Perfect. tendencies from the very beginning. And her sentence. The killer is the person you least expect. Oh, That's yeah, you, exactly. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Movie yeah. over 10 minutes in. Thank God that's done. <laughs> yeah. All right, we start the movie off. There's like this typical sort of Agatha Christie intro where it's a close-up of like a syringe being injected into the main character. Obviously, or it's a woman doing it as well. So you're going, oh, okay. So it's obviously not going to be a woman that did it. It's going to be, it's going to be accidentally um, killed by something, whatever. And then we, we get introduced to the 
investigator. Actually, the the method of killing was very similarly copied recently uh, in Knives Out. I don't know if you've oh, seen that. No, really? Yeah, I did watch it, but I couldn't remember if it was, it was eye drops. Yeah, so the, his insulin was, uh, the victim's insulin was changed out for something else in that as well. Um, and it was the nurse who poisoned him. And she then inherits all the money. Oh, well, like Knives Out is totally an homage to Agatha Christie type things. Quite, as well. quite frankly, it's way better job than this movie. But Yeah, I didn't like Knives Out. I didn't, I, no? I didn't, I didn't mind Glass Onion, though. I thought that was okay. Uh, yeah, that the second one, right? Had some good actors in that as well. Yeah, I just don't like Ryan Johnson. I think he's a dick. <laughs> don't know him personally. <laughs> well, he fucked up Star Wars, so that's why he's a dick. Oh, he, which Star Wars did he do? He did the second one of the the, the final trilogy. Oh, oh, oh! It was terrible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Whatever one that was, the last fucking Return of the Jedi, I, I, <laughs> whatever the hell it was called, the Return of the the Last Jedi movie. I've now forgotten it was so bad. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. Anyway, um, yeah, so we see Mister Hayward. He's in a cinema for some reason, and it uh, brings up the death of this Leonides, Mister Leonides, and uh, his granddaughter comes and sees him in his little private eye, generic, standard office that. We've seen in dozens and hundreds of movies, and she's like, oh, "I think the killer's still in the house." Mm. And so we get, yeah, to, like to, it, it, yeah. it's kind of like a film noir, like the setup with the secretary going, "Oh, we really need a case," <laughs> yeah. and then he's like, "Oh, but I don't want this case." Yeah, of course he does the whole trope where he first denies it, and then he goes to Scotland Yard to Mister Terence Stamp, mm-hmm. and uh, says, "What does he say?" He kind of goes. I don't know what he does actually. No, he doesn't. He uh, doesn't go then. He doesn't go then. He goes to. Oh yeah, he does actually. He goes. He to does. Yeah. 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 And then he, they go. Yeah. Scotland the, uh, Yard. Scotland Yard. And then he goes. Um, Your daddy yeah. wouldn't be proud if you'd been in a d- private dick. You should come and work for us. Yeah. So then it's it's known that the oh, the eye drop murder. They yeah, got it's for with glaucoma. Yeah. So yeah. So that's um. So he then he goes. Yeah, I'll take it. Then I'm gonna take it. It's too interesting for me to take it. Yeah, well, it, Terrence it wasn't Stamp obvious is going, that he was going to take it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be a movie. Terrence Stamp is going, all right, you do your shit there before we get there. You got, you got two days, and then I unleash the hounds. Yeah, which is totally unreal. That that really is unprofessional, Mr. Stamp. <laughs> yeah. So he heads there, and he drives up, and he meets very quickly the close sister, the, the sister of the late wife, Lady mm-hmm. Edith, played by Glenn Close. And yeah, she's probably the best shotgun for moles baby shotgun yeah shotgunning for moles it's a good (laughs) name of an indie album or band shotgunning for moles i would watch an entire movie of her just running around shooting at things with a shotgun that that would have been a much better movie (laughs) whack-a-mole with glenn close (laughs) (laughs) volume one (laughs) um so yeah she see like then we we meet the uh the younger girl josephine She's in the distance giving shit to her nanny, basically going, Oh, you're a mean little girl, aren't you? Nudge, nudge, wink, yeah, wink. Yeah, that's nothing to do with the killer at all. Don't worry about it. She's just being a psychopath yeah. on the second scene of the, you know, suspects. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's an exposition that obviously uh, Mr. Hayward, Charles, and Stephanie met in Egypt. We know we've, we've, um, we've seen that before. And then, um, uh, yeah, Sophia says we are a ruthless family. I don't see. Even with that, I don't. I didn't really get that from the family. No, they were a bunch of arseholes, But you know, yeah, not ruthless murderers. Like they're maybe, of, maybe the granddad was. Yeah, but a bunch of losers as well. The two sons. One is a failed writer of a book, and the other one's a failed business owner. They're, yeah, tw- they're idiots. Psychopaths, not. But you know. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't get that. You know, what she said about her family didn't hold true. No, no. They were not ruthless in different ways. They were just mostly pathetic and sad in <laughs> many ways. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So he has a little conversation with Josephine, the young granddaughter of the dead dude, and that's when she says, oh, 
the killer will be the least you expect. And he's going, oh, you know stuff around here, don't you? And she goes, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Then we meet Magda, which is the daughter, played by Gillian Anderson, black wig, trope, posh, overly posh. Drunk all the time. Accent, yeah. Not Still, again, very 2D. Not enough meat on the bone for Gillian Anderson for that to, to chomp into. Mm. Yeah, just, 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 at, at this point, there's been zero nuance to any of the characters. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we basically go through the next 10 minutes meeting all the characters, and you're going, okay, who's this, who's that, who's this? So then Sophia, yeah, Sophia's dad, whatever his name is, Philip, I think, yeah. He's not happy, he's like, oh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. I yeah. should have been the owner of the company, not that turnip Roger. Yeah, he hates his younger brother. But then he's a loser too because he's a failed playwright or whatever. He's a, I can't remember what type of books he wrote, writes, but he was writing, I don't know, some something crappy, unread um, scientific journals or some such rubbish. Yeah, he's a loser. Yes. Yes. So then we go into this beautiful white room and we meet Claire and Roger. Claire says, yeah, I do toxicology, so I'm a prime suspect for poisoning yes. my father-in-law. Okay, good to know. Clemency Leonidas. And she was um, played by Amanda Abington, who plays uh, Dr. Watson's wife in Sherlock. Oh. Which is a little bit of a detective link there oh yeah good good link there well then i didn't actually go down that far on the actor list i cut down as far as Gillian anderson said all right that's enough <laughs> the rest <laughs> of them i don't really care roger comes in and he's a just full-on aggro dude he hates the he hates Ma- um brenda. brenda yeah he hates brenda she killed him yeah. so then and mostly i think i think the, the roger does protest too much much is is the problem here like um he later on we find out ah, i've got to expose a fact from later on he, he yeah, fancy the pants off of brenda uh mm-hmm. mm, which was uh awkward uh she um charles our you know our amazing sleuth when he rushes out of the room angry roger he goes he's a sharp temper doesn't he yeah no shit sherlock <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, well done, me. Um, yeah. So, Mister Brown, the tutor, then is is uh, is is introduced, or we know that he exists. He's writing um, his memoir, the old oh, the dead dude's memoirs, and then we meet Mister Mrs. Leonides Brenda, played by Mad Men's Christina Hendricks. I never watched Mad Men, but. My wife knew who she was. Yeah, I was informed by my missus while watching it also that she's, um, again, very good in Mad Men. Again, I have not seen Mad Yeah, Men. why Why have we not seen it and our wives have? What Mad Men's all about chauvinistic businessmen in the 50s. Maybe it describes us too closely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Us yeah. businessmen. It's too, yeah, too predictable <laughs> for us to watch it. Anyway, she met up with Mr. Leonidas in Las Vegas as she was a dancer. So, um yeah, that's yeah, pretty much that. A bit, of, bit of a backstory to that. Then it goes, and then it's, it's, oh, it's, then we go into the spy bit, isn't it? Yeah, it's like okay, it goes Cairo twelve months ago, and I go, Jesus Christ, we're not going to be popping back to Cairo, but it pops up back to Cairo once, and it doesn't really. It tries to ex, do a bit of exposition on, you know, Charles and so, Sophia's relationship. But there's there's one of the big problems of this movie. That word exposition. Mm. Like I, I, I understand that movies need exp- exposition, you know, quite a bit. But this movie is nothing but. <laughs> it's just Constant. explain this bit, explain this bit, explain this bit, explain this bit, and then at the end, none of it matters because it all pivots on a notebook. Like, God yeah. damn it! <laughs> yeah, like none of these adults, none of these people care. Like, they, they don't really matter, and it's like a red herring bait, pretty much. And it's like and the this- entire movie is a red herring. And you know what? This type of movie is. That's important, but at some point, stop adding red herrings. Mm. <laughs> no, just deal with the main story at some point. Yeah, like so. This is obviously this. This flashes back to Cairo, where you know he's working for the Secret Service or whatever. I don't know what the hell he's working for. Some bloody something secret agent. Anyway, and this dude says, "Yeah, Sophia de Havilland. Her real name is Leonidas. Uh, oh, that's, a, yeah, that's your way in." So I was like, "I don't." know why he needs a way in and 
he needs to find out about him. I they will later find out that Mr. Leonidas is big in with the CIA, CIA. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. an anti commie chap. Yeah, yeah. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we flash back to present. We never go back to Cairo after that. So if you can forget about us even saying about that, talking yeah, about it's that. It's irrelevant to the story. <laughs> yeah. So Charles is in um, old man Leonidas' office and the tutor comes in, rushes into the safe and he's clicking away. And he's, uh, I don't know what he's doing. He's looking for the memoirs, isn't he? He's looking for the missing. memoirs. Yeah. Yeah. They're gone. Oh my God. Yeah. Then we have the Glenn Close shooting mole scene. Very nice. Awesome. Smashing holes into the uh even better than the first thing. mole killing scene yeah so then obviously we have the exposition again of that the tutor lawrence is having an affair with brenda the wife of mr leonidas another convoluted sort of story loop that doesn't really make any difference to the whole thing i think that was the another of the herrings to well this one was far too obvious you know um sleeping with the the young trophy wife type thing oh yeah 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 it's never going to be that easy with no, Miss Christie. Um, then we have an introduction of a. This is probably what forty minutes into the movie, and we get introduced to this other grandson, this playing chap, stupid yeah. guitar. <laughs> like, prum, so playing, prum, prum. Yeah, so we have a montage of just characters in the home doing nothing scenes, and we have the background of this stupid character grandson. Did you see, see that the the bust he had on a chair in front of him as he was playing the guitar had a um. It was an SS uniform hat. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, which was I a bit that. interesting. Yeah, a lot of the... Um, actually, there was one... Isn't the... Is it the... Oh, it's some... Isn't it the Remains of the Day? The movie with Anthony Hopkins. He's a butler in the mansion. Pretty much like this office or this, this mansion. I, I this movie. I've never seen it. Yeah, it's not that good, but it was Oscars are bound. I think Christopher Reeve is in it, Superman. As you just mm. mentioned, Superman earlier. There you go. We're going in full circle here. Um, but the owner of that house is big into the Nazis and big into the fascists. So it could be a little, could be a nod to that. It could be like a lot of rich people. Um, so rich um, people are Nazis as well. We're getting that here. Yeah, yeah. I think in the in the run up to the World War Two, or maybe even after it, there were still sort of people fascists, fascists like fascists. They do. Anti-communists, usually. Anyway, that was stupid, the guitar thing. Musical in- interlude. Um, Charles and Sophia go dancing. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the music is interesting in these couple of scenes. Um, actually pretty decent, but as, as to the award as you mentioned earlier, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Uh, we get into the whole point. Oh, the will has no signature on it. Now Brenda gets everything. Yay. Clearly she's guilty. Yeah. End of discussion. Stop the movie. Yeah. So so um, Charles goes snooping in this um, the business that they have. Can't remember the name of the business. It's a standard catering or system Something catering. catering, yeah. Yeah, it's going under. So it's exposed that Mr. Leonid has given a two million check to his son. Associ- associated catering is going under. There you go, yeah. His wife told, Roger's wife... Claire told him to rip it up. Yeah, that's a stupid thing to do. Take the money. Yeah. Take the check. Cash it. Spend it on cheese. I don't know. Yeah. So then um, Charles has a meeting with a CIA dude in a phone box. He's calling him. He's in the side-by-side phone box. That does feckin' stupid. (laughs) And, And especially when you consider the next scene when... There's a there's a guy who's been tailing um, Charles yeah. for a while, yeah. so the two lads start chatting about the tail. So um, one of them jumps in. Oh, the the CIA guy goes up the front and knocks in the window, and Charles jumps in the back and starts strangling him. <laughs> so, but if you're trying to be, you know, not very, you've been trying to be discreet, and then you're strangling somebody in a car five minutes <laughs> later, that's not discreet. So what was the point of the phone box? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I never thought about that. But my point is, why is Scotland Yard tailing them? Because they go to Scotland Yard then, and uh, Terence Stamp doesn't really say why he tailed them, really. Oh, he did. He, he said, um, I'm trying to keep you safe because these guys are dangerous, I think was the point. And also, know. he doesn't trust your his um, uh, Leonidas's um, 
affiliation with the CIA and the whole communist thing going on. You know, Leonidas was a character in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And he was also a Greek um, king. That's who it is. Sparta. That's who it is in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. That's him. That's the Was it? Okay. This is Sparta. Yeah, Yeah, that's the one. That chap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wrote down next cripple. (laughs) Cripple? (laughs) Just randomly. (laughs) (laughs) I wrote down cripple grandson equals annoying. Oh, yes. We're back. I don't know what he did. I can't remember. uh, Eustace, is it? I don't even know his name. Yeah, he was a nothing character. Useless is his name. Useless. Useless. Uh, (laughs) He said, oh, yeah, I don't really mind my grandfather being dead. It's one less capitalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was his time when he was talking to... Then he also said, it wasn't Brenda. She's not smart enough. Oh, yeah, he says that too. Yeah, well done. He's not not wrong. Am I wrong? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Sophia burns the memoirs. Don't know In in a bonfire, because, again, discreet... Yeah, have, yeah. Like twenty five fireplaces in the building. <laughs> no, I light a massive signal fire, so I can burn five sheets of paper. That's well done, good, love. That's a good, that's a good point. Twenty five fireplaces. <laughs> anyway, we have this trope dinner scene where all the families around the table. I don't know why they're all around the table having dinner, and they all just go off with one another. I didn't really take notes in that one because I just found it annoying. And I wrote down dinner misery. <laughs> dinner misery for everybody. Yeah, yeah. I did like use, use, that Useless did ask uh, an interesting question at the dinner table. That was, uh, did you screw my sister in Cairo? Oh, yeah. And yeah, if yeah. so, doesn't that make you um, potentially complicit with a potential killer of my granddad? True. That's, that's again, useless saying that. It was actually the one meaningful sentence in the whole dinner. Yeah. Don't be, um, don't be screwing sp- witnesses slash, you know, suspects. That's not very professional, buddy. No. And it's also, uh, this is when um, Philip and Magda get blindsided by finding out that dad need, daddy didn't even read the script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got, you got Mr. Brown to read it. And Mr. Brown went, ah, it's not actually that bad. Uh, and then he t- tossed a coin and, like, you know. It was negative for them, and then it was like, nah, you're not getting it, meh. Yeah, yeah. So, so granddaddy was, slash daddy was an absolute a hole. Yeah, so it was a big brother v brother fight then, and yeah. Um, Sophia fires Charles for um, what does he fire her for? Does she fire him for? I don't even know. Um, oh, I, I know, I remember now. He, she was com- he was comforting Brenda, holding her hands, going, oh, yeah, don't, let, "Don't let them get to you." <laughs> yeah, yeah, comforting. Dirty fecker. He was, well, I don't no, know. He was, he was a it, yeah, but it was, I couldn't it was read, a kind of stupid scene. I couldn't read his blank face. <laughs> yeah. Was he coming on to her or was he having a stroke? I don't know. I don't know. We never will know. Anyway, he decides to pop up to the tree hut just to um, have a look at <laughs> <laughs> newspapers or something. Oh, yeah, a bit of a bit of peeping Tom well, through the telescope. Through the telescope, sacred. doesn't even see anything. No. Uh, yeah, and the dogs are set on him, and that's fine. Whatever. Eustace sets the dogs on him because yeah, because he's an a-hole. Anyway, um, the, a new will is found by the lawyer, and Sophia is now the beneficiary. Fuck me. Why not? Hey. Yeah. Then the little girl is um, attempted to be murdered, and she, she or swing falls out of the same treehouse that her plucky. Detective was hanging out the night before. Yeah, remind me of Game of Thrones. Seeing yeah, this first season, but doesn't only... snap the old spine. No, no. yes, no. <laughs> so Sophie is first on scene, so there's a bit of suspicion on her too at that point. But whatever. Um, young brother and wife tries to go off to Barbados, but no, you can't do that. You can't. You can't go. It's a crime scene. Act of uh, crime scene. Mf. I wrote down at this point. Everybody has about about as much screen presence and charisma as a damp onion. Certainly not a glass onion. No. So of course Charles is still snooping around, finds shears in class the classroom drain. 
Um, Scotland Yard's taking over, yo. Get the hell out of here. Then he decides to try and save his ass on the case and goes up into a parapet or a turret or whatever the hell you want to call it and finds some notes. Love yeah, notes love letters. between Miss Brown and, yeah. and uh, Mrs. Leonidas or Leonidas yeah. or whatever the hell the pronunciation is. In this, pretty much, um, yeah. Pretty much. It, it implicates her pretty yeah. badly. So, yeah. In the past, I can... It has to be said, he had seen Josephine, the little girl up there, like a couple of nights before. So, he yeah, at, at this point, it's, it's super obvious. Yeah, there's no point doing spoilers on that. She did it. And it was so obvious at this point, it was ridiculous. The young granddaughter did it. So, Brenda's off to the nick with the, the tutor in the back of the paddy wagon. Josephine journal, oh, Josephine's gosh. journal is gone. Edith yeah. has two months to live. Like, where do I? What the hell is all these things coming up for? There's all these all these big drama moments coming up in the last fifteen minutes of the movie. I was like, get the hell on with it. Then she yep. Josephine dances around the bloody house like there's a ba- night ballet nightclub going on, all these lights. The, the, the one thing she misses at the end of her ballet dance is uh, flipping the bird at the granddad's big portrait. She doesn't do it, she just looks at it. She looks at it, yeah. So exactly. the next morning the next morning Nanny is dead from the cocoa that she always tries to give to Josephine. Charles yeah. is so angry with Josephine. She wants to, he's just like shaking her, going, Tell me the truth. You know everything, don't you? And she's going, Yes, I do know everything. So then um, Edith goes, Josephine, let me take you to get some ice cream. Oh, yes. And to Edith, yes. Well, yeah, so off they drive. Right. Yeah. And I'm going, Okay, you can't leave the grounds. The police aren't going to let you. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, the police person told me to get take Josephine outside. Okay, let her through, let her through. Uh, yeah, like. This is Detective Glover. Um, yeah. Like oh, well done. Turnip. Uh, but turnip. Nobody, not, not even a completely turnip plod. And listen, this is this is a guy in charge of, uh, or involved in murder investigation from Scotland Yard. You expect some form of ability. Oh, he's a dope. Couldn't I even follow that. a basic order. I love the stupid scene where the doctor is just hunkered over the, the nanny's body and goes, mm, yeah, it's probably cyanide. After, <laughs> after yeah, touch. I did notice that. He touches yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, dead. T- must be cyanide. Yeah, he touches her coat. Like, she has a coat on. And he touches her. And he's going, mm, yeah, my best guess would be cyanide. And Charles is going, okay. Rushes out to the yard and finds some cyanide things. Goes, Moles. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, yeah, maybe not. This is, this it's is eat it. loose, yeah. And but then, then it, it get, does try to lead you towards the idea that it's Edith. True, true. They try in vain, but then he, for some reason he starts drilling around in the barrel of lime and finds um, Josephine's journal. And Josephine, of course, admits yeah. to all the murders. What? Why did he in the building? Start- Digging around in the barrel of lime. Yeah, I don't know. I thought, I thought what the hell? Are you like, doing what, with what, that? what gave that away to him? Yeah, I don't know. Barrel of lime. Barrel Might of be lime. notebook in there. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I think I'll start digging. Yeah, off he goes digging with a trowel. Yeah, it was interesting. I don't know why I, I didn't like. I was very bored at this stage. I was like, get it's on with it, finish if, it. If you see a barrel of lime, it's obviously got a clue in it. <laughs> Dig around. Yeah, yeah. If you're ever in any point and click mystery game. <laughs> <laughs> always check the always click on the barrel of lime. Anyway, Josephine did it. They they're driving after either then going and she's reading out the um Sophia's reading out all of Josephine's journal and Josephine's voice is voiced over. It's kinda of confusing and hard to read. I was really bored, so I killed my granddad. Yes. That was so pretty then, much it. That was the reasoning behind it. Yeah, she was a psychopath. And I'm guessing the book probably goes into more of her more of her psychopathy. Psychopathy. Mm. Psychopathy. Yeah. So anyway, um, Edith was like going, I don't know why, like she obviously didn't want, um, what did, what did she, so did she, well, she, my... she, she left a um, confession to say that she'd killed granddad. Uh, and I think her plan was then to save the family name by, well, I think she was going to do it anyway. I think she was handing in the confession anyway to save Brenda and Mr. Brown, because she felt a bit bad for them, and she only had a couple of months to live, so she's like, "Feck it, I'll I'll take take it on the nose." Yeah, but why then, take then she caught who her? did it, and then she's like, "Oh, oh shit!" <laughs> yeah, why why did she why did she kill the young girl? She could have just drove off and drove off the cliff, and then oh well, no, they had her journal, I guess. They had her journal, so she was going to get caught 
also she was a psychopath going around killing people she was like ah fuck it I'll kill her on the way out <laughs> yeah so she pretty much Thelma and Louise it off the yeah. off a cliff <laughs> I was told, I was specifically told not to use that phrase it doesn't suit it's only a murder suicide not a suicide suicide by my wife but I think Thelma and that's Louise good. it fits the, exactly yeah you know that's what she does half half Thelma Thelma yeah. not Louise <laughs> or Louise not Thelma yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, if you don't know what that is, they drive, she drives her niece. No, her, not even related to her, actually. Barely, or, you know. No, not even nice. related. Not even related. She liked she, her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Josephine liked Edith. I don't know if Edith liked Josephine. Anyway, that was the end. Thing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, not the worst movie I've ever seen, um, but as you said, a bit cardboard. Yes cardboard box movie i gave the plot two out of five what did you give it i, I give it 2.5 just for for making me think for a second wait a second maybe she didn't do it <laughs> yeah. at, at 2.5 and i'm being i am being generous there i guess but yeah we've gone through all the uh the acting at the start just out of out of whack and that's fine that's good the way we do it um, obviously, Glenn Close has Fatal Attraction in her back pocket, and that's pretty much it. Nobody else is really. Well, Julian Sands, that was who played Philip, he was in Room with a View back in the he's, day. He was a decent actor. He wasn't in this. Um, no. Glenn was decent. Terence was on the screen for about 15 seconds. Julian was disappointing. Yeah, yeah. I was disappointed. I think Max Irons. He's constantly doing TV stuff now because I don't think he'll get a movie ever again. Uh, he basically is the star. He no he's supposed to, yeah, he's supposed to be the star of the show, but he's pretty cardboard, wooden, and a disgrace to his father. Yeah. Well, could compare this to a movie with Hercule Poirot, one of the, you know, uh, yeah. Peter Ustinov say. Yeah. He is so not Peter Ustinov. Nah, you need Like something. such a world and different. You need, you need somebody with punch. Peter Ustinov was a fantastic screen presence. This chap... It just couldn't carry, couldn't carry his socks. He's crap. <laughs> hey, it's hard to carry socks. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I, I, he, he totally annoyed me. So I gave acting one out of five, and that one is for Glenn Close. I, I give it one point seven five because I like Close. Uh, I thought Christina Hendricks, fifteen seconds, she was good. Gillian, yeah, disappointing. Yeah, yeah. God damn it. So I, I really like Gillian Anderson, like, uh, but oh, why not? And I really yeah. wanted to see something from her, you know. Yeah, but well, not today. Rewatch the X Files because that's the best you'll get. Yeah. Oh, well, she does play Maggie Thatcher in um, the Crown, right? She does. I haven't watched the Crown because I can't be bothered. <laughs> you don't like royalty. No, I just don't care. Yeah. Um, Sam Brackett's track. I didn't register it. I gave it one point five because I'm guessing there was there was some songs in there and that was fine uh yeah i give it two it was brief moments of decent music but, but outside of that it was kind of unnoticeable yeah and um, production I, I gave it average i gave 2.5 because i think you know a lot of the scenes were shot very Pure nice drama. yeah yeah, it was very nice scenery. It was, I think this, the props and the, the backdrops and the setting and the scenery were, were quite nice. The camera angles, cinematography was quite good and as well. There was a couple of Didn't notice angles. any digital watches. No digital watch. <laughs> yeah. No Starbucks coffees on the table. Yeah. So. Actually, just to harken back to the movie before, I, it's because of you, I listen out now for footsteps. And there yeah, was I'd... one particular scene in this where the footsteps were a bit loud. Oh, no. It, it annoyed me because of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just spreading the word of stupid false footsteps. <laughs> it shouldn't be yeah. a problem with 2010 movies and onwards. It's usually the older movies, 80s, maybe 90s, but usually where, where 60s, they have to inject 50s. in the footsteps. Yeah, because they don't actually have that much sound, probably because of the boom mics or whatever. Like that. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what did you give production? I give it two point five as well. Uh, middle of the road. Didn't blow me away, but there certainly was no problems with it. Decent scenes, decent cinematography. Yeah. 
Um, cool. Vikram Murthy at RogerEbert.com gave it 38 out of 100. The, act, the actors never once seem engaged with the material beyond the surface. Thus, Crooked House feels as lifeless as the corpse at its center. I, I, I actually get what he's saying. I think he was a bit harsh, but still, yeah, the actors don't engage. No. Katie Walsh in the Los Angeles Times gave it 90 out of 100. <laughs> <laughs> the twists and turns of the story keep you on your toes until the very end, never giving anything away. The verbal blows drop as fast as the bodies. There's only two bodies. And if British aristocrats fighting over money beautifully is your thing, Crooked House will more than satisfy. It will thrill. No. 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 Like, like okay, there's a bunch of so called twists, but. At times they feel a bit ham fisted. Um, yeah, possibly was... because of what uh, the Ebert person said and the, the lack of engagement from the actors and the lack of me caring about the characters they're portraying. Yeah, there's no joy. I don't feel any joy from the performances. Like, I know that the dialogue yeah. and this plot is not joyful, but you need to bring joyful to your acting. And... You need con strong conflict in a movie like this. Yeah. And there isn't believable conflict between the characters. No, and I guess they're always on a losing a losing path anyway after we watched The Big Lebowski before this one. So. Yeah, and that, that it is hard. It's a tough one to follow, really. It is. Yeah. But it's a different, it's a completely different type of movie. So if it was good, like if it was a glass onion or better, then yeah, you, you can enjoy it. But this felt weak. And I think the ratings we give are actually not impaired by our previous amazing movie. I think no, no, it is no. genuinely a weakish movie. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. All right, that's um, let's kill the crooked house with <laughs> cyanide and leave Mole. it. <laughs> Mole! <laughs> Mole! <laughs> All right, so um, remember 10 years ago when uh, we randomly picked a movie and we found out that actually it wasn't available <laughs> yet? Oh, yeah. I can't remember what episode it was. 20-something, probably. Anyway, we promised that we'd come back to it when it actually was released. In it was our Korean movie, wasn't it? Yes, it's a Korean movie. And I was watching Graham Norton there the other night, and the main actress was on it. And uh, that's I was like, oh. And they showed a trailer of it. It was like, oh, that's that movie. <laughs> All right, and, I, and I would never have uh, remembered it if it wasn't for Graham Norton. Thanks, so, Graham. Thanks a lot, Graham. So, um. It's got very, very good reviews. It's got 94 universal acclaim, a meta score, mm. and user, user score of 8.2. Uh, summary probably will more likely attract our wives to it rather than us, but it's an A24 <laughs> movie, your old friends. I do like A24. Uh, Nora and Hey Sun, two deeply connected childhood friends, are rest apart after Nora's family emigrates from South Korea. Two decades later, they are reunited in New York for one fateful week as they confront notions of destiny and love and the choices that make a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a talkie, isn't it? She yeah, had to talk in Korean as well, mostly. Oh, good. Yeah. It's a reedy. It's a reedy, yeah. One hour and 45 minutes. Okay. PG-13. Okay. Could so, be yeah. interesting. Yeah, you never know. I mean, somebody said something on the Graham Norton show saying they were they were ripped apart by it or something. or They were left um, shattered by it or something. So hopefully something weird happens during it. That would be good. Oh, maybe it's a bit of a... Um... Oh, what was that? Not Spotless Mind. Um, Requiem for a Dream style thing. Because that ripped me apart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be like that. Yeah. No, me neither. Yeah. No. All right. So that's episode 33, Done and Dusted. And we will see you on the next episode, episode 34, Wet Past Lives. Please keep on sharing, reviewing, telling people, random strangers on the street. Going up to them and just going, what's in K plus? Google then, it now. And then walking on, mumbling to yourself as you eat a bucket of fish heads. Shouting about moles. Moles. Mole, 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 mole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Austin Powers. Anyway, so um, 
There's only two people I hate in the world. So. <laughs> the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> people no. who are intolerant of other people's cultures. All right, uh, we're done. Episode 33 in the can. We'll see you next time for episode 34. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Cheerio.